Here's to Main Street, not Wall Street. Here's to being invested in each other. Here's to a return to what matters. Elevations Credit Union. It matters where you bank. Visit us online to see why. Well, good afternoon, everybody. Glad that you're here. I may take this off because I tend to speak loud anyway, so it's hard for me to kind of whisper so that it works well for you where you're at. But um, I learned something new. Uh, you know, every organization has a culture, and you, uh, your industry is no different. But when I was in the back waiting to go on for the power talk, someone said, well, if you say the word realtor, say it, did I say it right? Yeah. Okay, I just want to get that out of the way. I want you to know, number one, that I know how it's pronounced, but if it comes out wrong, you can go ahead and leave. I'll, I'll understand. Real tour. Doctor, real tour. Got it. Okay, good. See, and you never know that. I mean, there's cultures. I mean, age groups, generations have different cultures. I mean, it's the cultures that uh, build up over time, and it's the cultures that often can drive us nuts. Now, this is on the older generations. And I think, on many levels, this might be the more relevant of the two sessions. And only, I say that only because we are growing older as, as a world. The world is growing older. And uh, more and more people are going to be uh, in the senior citizen realm than there are going to be younger people. And particularly in the United States, there's a big issue there. It's how are we going to take care of some of these older people as they age? And that's a big question with the generation of the younger generations. But, uh, and also, generations have to go both ways. So there's often this sense that we have to accommodate and focus on the younger generations at the expense of our own generation, but I think it goes both ways. The younger generation has to look forward and adjust and make uh, impact on the older generations as well. So it goes both ways, and I think it's a very important thing. And so I'm glad that you're here. We're going to look at uh, the older generations that are impacting the marketplace. Now, when you think about baby boomers, okay, they can't, they're not babies anymore, they're older, uh, and you said one turns uh, 60 every four seconds for the next 18, for the next 18 years. Wow. Think about that. A boomer will turn 60 every four seconds for the next 18 years. That's phenomenal. But the boomers are so large in number, they're at 78 million uh, large. And so they have had a lot of influence. They have had a lot of say in how popular culture is shaped, how culture is shaped, how cells are shaped, all of that. But when you think about boomers, and we live with stereotypes all the time, what are some of the stereotypes that might be applied to boomers? They have gray hair. Okay. Rock and roll. How about sex, drugs, and rock and roll? How many were involved in that? Uh, is it... <laughs> Groovy. All right, far out. I'll tell you that, far out. Anything else? Vietnam. Hippies. Vietnam vets. Vietnam vets, yes, for sure. Woodstock. Woodstock, yes, Woodstock. Anything else? The Beatles. Huge. I'm a huge Beatle fan. I'm what they call a tweener. I was born in 1963, so I am either an uh, old Xer or a young boomer. So I straddle kind of both worlds a little bit. Uh, but everyone who sees, if you go by the, the, the definitions of the dates, I'm officially a baby boomer. So uh, I, I like the Beatles. Uh, I'm trying to get my kids to like the Beatles. I said, you're never going to listen to uh, Christine Aguilera 40 years from now like you're going to listen to the Beatles. <laughs> 40 years from now, too, I bet. So anyway, anything else with boomers? Okay, how many boomers are in the room? Okay, quite a bit. Uh, we're also going to talk about the matures, too. Are there any matures in the room? Okay, great. Glad that you're here. Fantastic. Uh, matures are uh, people way better than we are. Uh, no, the matures are those born before 1946. Born before 1946, okay? So we're going to talk about the matures a little bit too because none of us is as smart as all of us and you can't have one without the others. So I believe this is a continuum when you think about generational studies. It's a continuum. It's not these separate silos that there's 
Gen X, and there's the millennials, and never do they uh, mix and match. I think there's this common thread that comes through all the time, and it doesn't have to be that big a deal. But it is a big deal because there are five generations alive today in the United States. That has never happened before in the history of our society. The oldest generation are the matures born prior to 1946. How many were in the power talk? Okay, I just want to make sure that I'm not... Uh, I'm going to have to repeat, I guess, because there's some people that weren't in there. But uh, the matures born prior to 1946. Now, the oldest of the matures, that cohort, is known as the GI generation. And as I mentioned in the power talk, I am a hospice chaplain. It's one of the things that I do. And I've been walking alongside the GI generation most every week as they pass on. The younger of the matures are called the silents. And I don't know why they're called the silence, but apparently uh, the transition, it was, it was after World War II and the Great Depression, it was just kind of there. Now, how many of you watch the show Mad Men? That is the younger matures. That show is all about them as they were, uh, as they were working in the 60s. So Mad Men really is a snapshot insight into the silent generation of the matures. Interestingly enough, a very, very popular show. But if you start thinking that way, you're like, oh. It kind of puts a, a, a more of a younger face to them than we normally do. So born uh, prior to 1946. Then they came back, many of them, the oldest, came back from World War II and really got busy. They gave rise to the largest generation ever to hit the shores of the United States, and that's the baby boom generation, born between 1946 and 1965. How many boomers do we have in the room? I already had that show of hands, didn't I? All right, let's forget that. Um, <laughs> all right. Uh, they're they're uh, called the pig and the python, and if we think in snapshot pictures, so think about a, a snake. It's flat, and if you think about a snake that opens its mouth, reticulates its jaw, and swallows a pig, that's exactly what the population levels did when the boomers came on, on board. So around 1946, it was flat, and then 1940, whomp, I mean, it went to unbelievable proportions, and then it started to tear down again in 1964. And it was just, we've never seen anything like it. We've never had those numbers before in our midst. And so the boomers are really used to calling the shots. They really impacted popular culture. They impacted a lot of how leadership occurs in business world, a lot of strategies. And so there was a great deal and amount of influence that's important to understand, particularly if you think about some of the other philosophies from the younger generations that are coming up on how to lead and how to sell and all that stuff. So we have the boomers. Then the boomers were so large, they gave rise to one and a half generations. They gave rise to Generation X, born between 1965 and 1980. How many Gen Xers do we have? Okay, great. Now, what's interesting about the Gen Xers is, as I said in the Power Talk, they are the smallest in number by far. So you have the 78 million baby boomers on one end. You have the millennials, which we'll look at in just a second, even larger, by the way, at 82 million than the boomers. And then squeezed in the middle are the Xers at 56 million. So you have this dynamic of a high, low trough, high again. And no wonder Xers feel a bit like underdogs, because the fact of the matter is they are. There were some reasons why they're so low in number. In the 1960s, birth control came onto the scene. And so now we could forego, boomers could forego pregnancy, and all of a sudden the birth rates went way down. Now the Xers are making up for lost time. They don't want to uh, have their children feel the same way they're feeling, and so they've contributed to the other half of the millennials as well as the boomers. And the millennials were born between 1981 and 1999, 82 million strong. How many millennials do we have? Okay, everyone take a look at them. <laughs> Sneer at them, do what you want to do. <laughs> I am so glad you're here, by the way, because it does go both ways. I mean, in order to relate effectively, you have to know how the older generations work. In order to relate effectively, you have to know how the younger generations work. So thank you for coming. I think that's pretty impressive. Those hands are going to go up more and more and more and more because they are slowly taking over. And they're taking over with different mindsets. They're taking over with different philosophies. They're taking over with different values, attitudes, and expectations, depending on what was going on as they were coming of age. So it'll be very interesting to see as we, as we, inter, inter, uh, as we dialogue together 
what kind of dynamic that's going to be. And then the youngest generation, no one has called them anything officially. Some have said maybe the Homelanders. Uh, I'm calling them the Hypers, uh, born after 2000, uh, just because the metabolism of our culture is so uh, fast and everything is happening so in the sudden and right now so that, uh, you know, who knows what's going to uh, come up and how that's going to impact their lives. Okay, but let's take a look at the oldest generation. We're going to take a look at the matures, and we're going to take a look at the boomers, all right? Very much uh, some interesting dynamics. Here's why I think this uh, is so relevant, too. The latest Atlantic Monthly has as their cover story the new science of old age. Inevitably, people grow old. They say the days go long, the years go by really fast. No one has ever told me, man... It's taking forever to grow old. <laughs> you never hear that. And it doesn't seem that long ago when I was 15, 16, 17, 18. But because of the large numbers of the boomers, this is a huge uh, topic right now. So the, whole, the Atlantic Monthly is uh, dedicating a whole article to the new science of old age, what living to 100 will mean for you and for society. We are living longer. That's why there's five generations alive today in the United States, because our lifespans are stretching. So we have 72 million baby boomers. And let's take a look at the uh, oldest generations. As you were coming of age, when you were 15, in a sophomore in high school, that's when most of your values, attitudes, and expectations were locked in. So think about when you were a sophomore in high school, chances are even though the skin may be sagging a little bit more and the hair has been, uh, been moving, that's a union thing. You're going to get in trouble. Uh, I messed with the uh, sound. So. <laughs> um, what was I saying? Sagging skin. Sagging skin. Yes. Yeah, I remember. <laughs> Sagging skin. So even though... That, uh, but who you are internally, your values, attitudes, and expectations are probably pretty much the same as they were then. So the formative themes that I talked about in the Power Talk, uh, adversity, diversity, technology, economy, and complexity, all have, uh, they all work together in uh, synergy to define and create a culture. And I have defined each of the cultures with a C word. And if I had to define up the culture for the matures on how they were coming of age, as they were sophomores, most of them, the, the majority of their lives was spent in conflict, a lot of conflict. You had the Great Depression, you had World War II, then you had the whole transition from World War II into what the United States was going to become economically, and there was just a lot going on, a lot of conflict. What does conflict do to your values, attitudes, and expectations? Well, something emerges if you are immersed in conflict during your formative years, and you can see with the matures, they're patriotically very loyal, very loyal. And it makes sense, right? Because they fought in World War II, and they're very uh, much patriotic, and they were used to following orders. So you had the organization man in the 50s and 60s. Everyone wore the suit. Everyone worked the same. Everyone followed the orders and followed the route, route orders. That, that's what the older generations did. That's how they worked. They clicked their heels, they saluted, and they followed their orders. And they're incredibly patriotic, loyal. They're sacrificially very giving. Interestingly enough, as a percentage of income, Matures gave more to charitable organizations than we do today. And they had far less to give. Unbelievably giving, sacrificially so, that as a percentage of income, they are giving so much more, they gave so much more and are giving so much more of their money away than any other generation has before. They're ethically very clear. Now, this has a lot to do with black and white. They're very black and white on a lot of things. And, and ethically, this is, this is the enemy. We, it's fascist Germany. It's imperial Japan. We're not sure who the enemy is today. It could be our next door neighbor. Details at 10. We're not quite sure. And so we think about neighbors for a minute. When my grandmother was um, uh, around, she said that she would, when a new neighbor moved in, she would make a casserole in a casserole dish bring it over to this new neighbor, knock on the door, and a social exchange would occur. It was wonderful. But what do you do with a casserole dish once you're done with it? you got to wash it and bring it back, right? And then a cup of coffee would uh, uh, you know, be given, and a friendship would be uh, developed among a neighbor. Today, 
If a new neighbor moves into our neighborhood, we're lucky if we notice it, number one, but we will go to the grocery store, buy the frozen chocolate chip cookie dough thing, slice it up, bake it, put it on a paper plate with saran wrap, wait till the opportune time, put it on the patio, ring the doorbell, and run. We have done our neighborly duty. How many of you here know the first and last name of everyone on your block? Boy, real tours. <laughs> That's real tours right there. Um, yeah, most people don't. And we're very afraid as a nation. If you don't even know your neighbors, we're afraid of those we don't know. And if we hardly know our neighbors, that, helps, that makes us fearful even in the neighborhoods that we live in. But it wasn't so much the way with the matures. They knew their neighbors. They knew who uh, everyone was. And they had a lot of relational uh, time with those close to them. So they had the neighbors. And they were ethically clear because then they knew who the good guys and the bad guys were. It wasn't the neighbors. But it could be now today. Everything is more gray today when it comes to ethical issues. It's not as black and white as it was for the matures. They're respectfully obedient. And I mentioned already that they'll click their heels, they'll salute, and follow orders. I mean, they're very, very obedient. They'll do, what's, what, they'll do really well what's asked of them. Now, again, these are generalizations. When you talk about generations, they are generalizations. So this may not apply to everyone because there are individuals within generations. But from what we understand from formative themes and the culture of conflict, these are some of the values, attitudes, and expectations. Now, you can disagree at any time, and I, and I welcome that for sure. Um, they're amazingly hard working. My grandfather was 45 years older than me. He started a foundation company, so he did residential basements. And I don't know if you've ever worked in uh, putting a basement in a foundation with the concrete. It's the hardest job I have ever done. My grandfather, however, would trot around the work site. He never stopped. He would just go, 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 go. I don't think I'm that lazy, but I would take you know, tons of water breaks, and he wouldn't take any. And he just kept running around, running, amazingly hard working. And to them, and we'll talk about this in a little bit, if you're not sweating, you're not working, according to the matures, right? I mean, how can sitting in an air-conditioned office really be working? If your hands aren't moving, you're not really working. They're innately frugal, and a lot of this has to do with the economy as they were coming of age. The Great Depression, uh, coming out of World War II and trying to come up uh, uh, with that. And so frugal is a very relevant word today, very relevant. I mean, Europe's getting into all kinds of issues because there's austerity measures, but there's a lot that we can learn from the matures with the whole idea of them being innately frugal. In fact, there's layaway now. I remember layaway when I was growing up. There's layaways come back again, right? You remember layaway? You just put the product aside and you make monthly payments, and when it's paid in full, then you take it home, okay? The boomers reverse all that because of consumer credit, and we'll take a look at that in just a minute. So. Conflict as the formative theme for the matures. These are the values, attitudes, and expectations that have emerged. I'm sure there's more, but for the most part, they're loyal, giving, clear, obedient, hardworking, and very frugal. Very relevant for the day and age that we're living in today. Now, let's take a look at the boomers. If there had to be a C word that summed up their particular uh, cultural uh, influence, it would be control. Control. Now, I always like to look at popular culture and see once uh, if there's anything relevant we can uh, derive from that. Well, in the late 60s, early 70s, there was a television show called Get Smart. Do you remember Get, Get Smart on a shoe phone? Well, it's interesting because who remembers the organization that Smart worked for? The control. The enemy was chaos. Right? Isn't that interesting? Here we are in the midst of uh, Vietnam, Watergate, things were just seeming so out of control that the heroic organization in the show Get Smart was named Control. Regardless of how we were going to do it, we were going to gain control. And Smart was an amazingly bumbling detective. And even though we weren't quite sure how to gain control, we're going to bumble our way along, but that is what we have to get back. Interestingly enough, the enemy was chaos. Now, as we look at the younger generations in the next session, their C word is chaos to shape them. And if there's the biggest clashes among the generations right now, it's between the chaos of the Xers and the control of the boomers. 
but they're used to being in control because they're so large in number. And certain values, attitudes, and expectations emerge. For the most part, boomers are experientially oriented. And basically what that means is they want to experience things. They still want to jump out of the airplane and parachute, but their knees aren't quite taking it like they used to anymore. <laughs> Disneyland came onto the scene, a very experiential theme park. And so boomers are rewriting what retirement is all about, too. They're not just going to sit on a rocking chair and read books all day. They're going to experience things. The whole um, uh, retirement industry is changing, and it's changing with the recreational vehicle industry. We've done some presentations with the RV industry of America, and they said, here's what's happening because of the boomers and their, their uh, uh, wanting to experience and be... Uh, I wanted to say convenience, but I don't see that up there. They, they, they like convenience, too. So here's what's happening in the RV industry, okay? The RV industry is telling you that if you want to go on a trip in the RV, not to worry, because the boomer will come with all of his family and all of the stuff and all of the luggage, and a concierge will meet you. The concierge will unload the luggage, put it away, and then take you inside this wonderful RV with a high-definition screen TV, show you that everything has been stocked already with great red wine and uh, peel and eat shrimp, and it's all set to go. And then they'll ask the boomer where they'd like to go. And all they have to do is plug it in the GPS, and the boomer just has to follow an arrow and go along. You're driving forward in this whale. But when you get to where you need to stay, you have to back up into your spot. Not to worry, says the RV industry. We have a concierge that'll come along and do that for you. So a concierge will get in, boop, 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 back up the RV, hook up all the sanitation so you don't have to get your hands dirty with that. And then the boomers come back to work and go on and on and on about how great it was roughing it for two weeks uh, out in the wild. But they're very convenient-oriented. I don't have that up there, but they like convenience, and they're very experientially oriented. They want to experience things. They want to experience all that RVing has to experience. So retirement is changing dramatically because of that, um, uh, that because boomers are prone that way. They're conveniently very, fo oh, there it is, conveniently focused. So they like what works. And think about that. When my grandmother, I, he, in their house, they still had the box where they put ice in so that you could take the ice and put it into a place, and that's how you kept your food. Boomers, all of a sudden, with this great economic expansion, we had refrigerators that were being built. We had dishwashers. We had washing machines. We had all of these things, these conveniences, that can now take over some of the hard work of churning a, 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 a piece of cloth or clothing you know, to clean that. So they were used to being conveniently very focused. They had things that did the hard work for us. And so they had all these products, they had washing machines and, and all that, so they're very uh, conveniently focused. They're endearingly nostalgic. Boomers at heart are big kids. They love their childhood. In fact, they had an amazing childhood. They did. Think about the toys that they played with. My daughter loves the hula hoop. That's a boomer toy. Inline skates are just roller skates that the boomers developed as they were coming of age. They're incredibly uh, nostalgic. So if I start singing in a room of baby boomers, M-I-C-E-Y-M-O-U-S-E, -E. people are bawling right now. They just... <laughs> Love that. Incredibly nostalgic. Uh, endearingly nostalgic. There's something great about uh, the boomers and their playfulness about life, which is also why retirement is changing as well. They're playful. Uh, in, in many ways. They're stubbornly resistant. And basically what that means is they're so used to being in control that change for them sometimes is a hard concept to deal with. It's sometimes very hard to have somebody come up against your values and your attitudes and expectations because yours has been developed and at 78 million there are a lot of boomers who have particular values, attitudes, and expectations. They're used to being in control because their numbers were so large. And so they're very resistant uh, oftentimes to changes and other uh, dynamics that are coming down the pike. And if you think about the clashes with younger generations and older generations, some of it is this. Change. Uh, being open to change. Being able to uh, deal with change. Uh, we, boomers can tend to be very, very resistant. They're rightfully deserving. And that basically means that, yes, they are. They have done a lot for our society. They have done an amazing amount. And they're continuing to do an amazing amount 
uh, for our culture. They protested the Vietnam War. They went and looked, worked for women's rights and other kinds of civil rights and all of those things. So now they're getting to a point where they're retiring and they're thinking about moving on. Well, they feel that they're deserving of what's coming their way. That Social Security ought to be there uh, because I have worked hard for that, and so that has to be there. That's a huge issue. Um, many of them uh, want to retire, but they can't because they're so financially strapped. Of all the five generations that we're looking at, the boomers are in, by far in the most consumer debt of any of them. But it makes sense because instead of layaway, all of a sudden we had this thing called consumer credit where you could put things on a credit card or on credit, take the object home now and pay for it, heck, who knows when, somewhere down the road. And that debt has built up and built up and built up. If you ask baby boomers, two-thirds of them have no idea how they're going to retire. Two-thirds on the income that they have or the money that they have saved. So it's a huge, huge issue, and they're very financially strapped. So boomers are dealing with that issue as well, and if they think they can retire, then with the economy given that it was in 2008 and on, many of them have to stay on the job in order to continue to make money. Well, this can bring clashes with the younger generations as well. So control for the boomers, they're, or, they're experience oriented, they're focused, they're nostalgic, they're resistant sometimes, they're deserving, and they're financially very strapped. Any questions on the boomers? Any insights? I can wait all day. No, I'm sorry. <laughs> Yes. That's right. That's right. Yeah, known as the sandwich generation. You've probably heard of that, where a lot of the boomers are in between having kids of their own, trying to get them through college, and then having parents who uh, have aged with health issues and having to deal with all of that. So. Uh, our really good friends who are our neighbors, they moved uh, because they needed a larger house because his mom is going to move in with him. And they have two little kids about this high. So that's a huge dynamic, too, that boomers uh, are having to deal with as well. Great. Thank you. Anything else? Right. I mean, it just went fast, and we all still think we're 23. Right. That's exactly right. Yeah. I mean, I, I'm 51. It's surreal to me. I have a 19-year-old son who's a sophomore in college. That's surreal to me. And in many ways, I don't feel much different than I was when I was 15 or 23. It's just everything on the outside package has changed quite a bit. But that happens. People and generations move on, and this is incredibly hard for the baby boomers to accept because they're so youthful in their orientation. So there's this cycle of life that we all experience. So you think about growing up, you're born, and you live, and then you have adolescence and young, and you end up having a minivan, and you go through, and then you end up being pushed again in a wheelchair. That's the cycle of life. All of us have to deal with it. All of us have to live with it, and boomers are having a very hard time. They're having a very hard time. I'm having a very hard time with it. And how many of you have seen the movie City Slickers? Okay, love that movie. It's uh, with Billy Crystal, and Billy Crystal pay plays the role of an advertising executive, and he sells advertisements on the radio. But the movie opens with him having a midlife crisis. He just turned 40, and he's beginning to wonder what it's all about. Did his life make any difference? Does he want to go some other direction? And so there's this angst that Billy Crystal is dealing with. His son has signed him up to speak to his fifth grade class on career day about what he does. His son investigated a little more closely what it is Billy Crystal did and realized in his mind, my dad just sells air. Nothing exciting about that. So he ends up getting in front of the fifth grade class, his son, to introduce his dad, Billy Crystal, and he says, I want you to meet my dad. He's a submarine commander. <laughs> Last straw for Billy Crystal. He gets up in front of you, the fifth grade class, and here's what he says. Value this time in your life, kids. Because this is the time in your life when you have so many choices and it goes by so fast. When you're a teenager, you think you can do anything and you do. 
Your 20s are a blur. Your 30, you make a little money, you uh, buy a house, and you wonder to yourself, what happened to my 20s? Your 40s, you start growing a little belly, you grow another chin. A girlfriend from high school becomes a grandmother, and the music starts to get too loud. The 50s, you have a surgery. You'll call it a procedure. <laughs> but it's a surgery. The 60s, the music's still too loud, but it doesn't matter because you can't hear it anyway. The 70s, you and the missus retire to some warm environment where you look for the ultimate in soft yogurt, muttering to yourself, how come the kids don't call? How come the kids don't call? You start having breakfast at uh, the night before, lunch at 10 in the afternoon, dinner at about 4, and then when you're 80, you end up having a major stroke and you end up babbling to some Jamaican nurse who your wife can't stand but whom you call mama. <laughs> Any questions? And the camera's looking at these fifth graders and they're like, what in the world is all of this? But Billy, he just, you know, pours out there. That is the angst of growing old. That's the angst of the life cycle. And the boomers were the generation that was being poked and prod and studied because there were so many of us, the boomers out there. But now they are moving on. They're now one of the older generations, which is hard to admit, but it's the fact. Just like the Xers are now getting into older ages. And the millennials, too, before they know it, will be in through the older ages. That's why we're growing uh, older as a society faster than we can imagine. There's going to be more that are older than younger around the world. The whole world is aging. That's why the Atlantic Monthly has a whole, like I said, a whole thing on the new science of aging because it's a reality and it's happening. And it's hard for the boomers. Because like I said, they still want to parachute out of the airplane and experience life, but their knees don't quite take it like they used to. I mean, I love to play basketball, but I had to give that up a while back because my knees just don't take that uh, uh, anymore. Now, I can shoot pretty well. I can beat my son in horse, but I can't run with him at all. So, uh, so this is hard for the boomers. Any questions on that or any insights? Okay, let's talk about some work habits. Now, what are some assets that the matures and the boomers bring to the marketplace? Let's focus in on the marketplace. What are some assets that the older generations bring to the marketplace? Experience, okay? Can't get that just overnight. Experience. Anything else? Discipline, okay? They've learned over the course of time. Uh, the experience, discipline, being able to kind of follow a path. Anything else? Loyalty, okay? Very loyal. What's that? Gratitude. Gratitude. Okay. Wisdom. wisdom. Yes, thank you. I tried to find an app for wisdom so I could download it, you know, to my... Couldn't do it. I mean, it's a function of time, and it's... it's, it's wisdom comes from scar tissue. Do you know what I mean by scar tissue? <laughs> Life kicks you down a little bit, and it makes it rough on you, and it's that healing of that scar tissue where wisdom comes. Well, when I was younger, I wish I had more wisdom. I had my grandfather, and i got to tell you, he was my best friend. He's impacted my life more than any other person. It's because he poured wisdom into my life. And that's part of why younger and older need to really coordinate and work together because you have the wild ideas of the younger, the visions, the energy. But you also need the wisdom uh, of doing that. Good teachers take uh, information and turn it into knowledge. Great teachers take knowledge and turn it into wisdom. And so, thank you. I think wisdom is a huge thing uh, that aging brings. Okay, unpack that a little bit more. Mm, good point. Right, right. Great point. So with all of that being said, what difference does that make to you real tours? Yeah. How, how, how would you sell to a boomer? None of you know how? <laughs> What's that? Work hard at it, right? Huh? Yeah. <laughs> Be honest, okay? Be forthright. Speak up, 
Uh, Xers love that too. Xers have great BS detectors. Uh, uh, but yeah, be honest up front with them. Uh, what else? What are some things that you're finding uh, that is helpful or frustrating working with boomers in the market? Patient. I heard patient again over here. Because you're right, they like to be in control. They want to be in control. Trust. Trust. Unpack that a little bit. Oh, I, <laughs> sorry, I'm looking at him right now. No, you go ahead. <laughs> Okay. Right, right. And some of that is just how salesmanship culture developed over time. I mean, it was just that, you know, sort of the... Exactly. Right, right. So there's that inerrant distrust of salespeople. That's a great point. Oh, yeah, yeah, they're still looking. Cause I know a lot of the uh, big popular houses now have, they're close to open spaces and because and, uh, boomers just want to keep going on. So my last two listings were with the uh, children that were boomers selling their parents' home and their parents are still alive. So it's being available for multiple siblings to make decisions, but yet the seller is actually the old, the mature. Interesting. Yeah. So it's being available. You have yeah. to be available because you have multiple parties that are coming at you with questions and information. Yeah. And you have to know family dynamics. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, I mean, I think about hospice chaplaincy. I mean, you have families that are right on the same page. It's wonderful. And then you've got families that, you know, they're at each other's throat because who's getting the inheritance and who isn't. And it's just, you know, a mess. And I could see where that could be part of the you know, the matures and the boomers and, and uh, else. I have some boomers whose parents are mature and want to live with them. They want to be independent, so I have to find them a walkout structure, access to walk out from the outside so that they can still get on with their life. Yeah, yeah. Have you noticed, and I think I've read that this is a trend where uh, architects now are, are building, um, I mean, there's a lot of ranch homes just because, you know, it's easier for boomers to walk around ranch homes, but they also have entryways that are much wider than normal houses so that, you know, they can get their walker through when that day comes. Uh, so even some of the way houses are being built are being uh, built to accommodate some of the challenges of aging and the boomers as they come of age. Mm -hmm. Good point. Yeah, they like to be in control and they want to see everything that's going on. And uh, they have BS detectors, like I said, and they're a little skeptical anyway of salespeople, as you, as you mentioned over there. So good point. Anything else? Okay. Mm-hmm. 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 Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Interesting thing about communication. Um, we've struggled with communication since we first stepped foot on the planet. I mean, it's a problem. It's been an issue. How in the world do we communicate with one another? And then over the course of time, certain things develop. Cave paintings were, you know, painted on to kind of communicate something to somebody. Then we had the Pony Express, and that was a great way to get messages pretty quickly from one point to the other. Uh, you had the telephone, which was an amazing thing. One telephone uh, is pretty powerful. One telephone to two telephones is pretty powerful, but you have one telephone connected to 100 other telephones. Now we're talking about power, and that's what it is today. So the problems have remained the same. It's the tools that change. And we have so many tools for communication. Uh, someone from an older generation would typically want to pick up the phone and talk to somebody. 
Well, I... Uh, <laughs> Right. But that's how they were conditioned. Um, right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So, yes. Great point. Yeah, there are so many tools out there. You need to know what the tools are and how to use them, but there are certain clients that are going to prefer one means of communication over another. And if you're working with someone from an older generation, a phone call probably was one of the best things. That's just what they're used to. Yeah. <laughs> All right. <laughs> so here's a, here's a little tool that, I mean, here's a little insight that, that I, I thought about, that the more relationally significant a piece of communication is the least amount of technology you ought to use. So the more relationally significant a piece of communication is, the least amount of technology you ought to use. So call me old-fashioned, but I still think the young man who's in love with his girlfriend should get on one knee, open up that box with a diamond and said, will you marry me? He should not text that. <laughs> so there are times and <laughs> there's, there's strategies. There is just strategies on what to use. I, I appreciate that point. Yeah. <laughs> Anything else? Good stuff. Let me just see what time we got here. 3.14. Okay, we got about 10 minutes, all right? So that's what uh, we haven't talked about that much, have we? The work habits. All right. Now, these are generalizations again, uh, but these are some of the habits that seem to have formed with the older generations as they were getting into the work world and coming of age. A job is what you are. So you ask someone from an older generation what it is they do, they'll give you a litany of their resume. You ask someone from a younger generation what they do, they'll look at you blankly and go, I snowboard. What do you mean, what do I do? They're not as caught up in their identity with what they do because they want a huge work-life balance. But for older generations, it was a mark uh, of what you did and the title that you had was very, very important. So a job is what you are. I remember when, and this happens all the time when we wax nostalgic, I remember when. My grandfather did I remember wins all the time. I remember when, Jeff, I was your age. I couldn't afford snowshoes, so I had to wrap barbed wire around my feet, and we went uphill uh, in both directions. I remember, you know, but we tend to, even in the workplace, talk about, oh, I remember the good old days when it was so much easier to deal with clients. And that's just what happens when you get older, but you've got to move a little bit beyond the I remember wins. So uh, good things come to those who wait. You did your time in the office. You spent overtime. You worked it through. You had a position you wanted to get to. And after a few years, you moved into that position. And then you worked even harder, and you just waited it out, waited it out, and you moved into that new position. You could do that if you stayed at a company long enough. Younger generations aren't staying that long at a company. Uh, and so they feel in their minds that they could jump real quickly to another position without having to wait necessarily. But for older generations, good things come to those who wait. If your hands aren't moving, you aren't really working. This is mainly the oldest of the, of the older generations, but like I said, if you don't have sweat on your brow, how can that possibly be work if you're sitting in front of a screen and you're an air conditioner? Real work is, is physical. Real work is there's some grunt work involved in it. You may not like it, but by, by golly, you've got to do it. There's things you've got to do that you just don't like, but you've got to do it. Uh, we have to have a system. 
There has to be something that works for us. There has to be a system in place that we can work through to get things done. Well, the younger generations are up, up, uh, upsetting that system or some of the systems because they have different systems. Sometimes their system is better than the older generation systems. And this is creating all kinds of conflict and issues. Uh, technology will never outdo hard work. Technology is important. It is. Uh, I'm finding out, I, I thought I was pretty savvy with most uh, technology. I mean, I, I prided myself a little bit on trying to be. I've given that up. I've given that up. I mean, it's happened so quickly. Technology is changing at such a breakneck pace. I have a 19-year-old. He's my oldest. I have a 15-year-old. She's my youngest. And my 15-year-old is twice as savvy as my 19-year-old in technology. Because that's how fast things have changed, and she's much more immersed in the newness of the technology than my 19-year-old. Four years difference. And there's a huge, huge gap between their ability to work with technology. So there's something to be said about technology tends to take us away. It distracts us. It keeps us from what's really important in life, and it, it takes away, it makes us less than good workers. There's sort of that attitude, there's sort of that uh, uh, mindset that comes from the older generations. So are you seeing this to be true or not true or, okay, any comments on that? Must you must be old. Yeah, 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 well there's studies with the youngest generations, maybe more with the hypers than even the millennials, but um, they're finding out that they're having a very hard time discerning uh, emotions face-to-face. -face. They do it with emoticons on text, so they know if you're happy because there's a smiley face, but they're not quite sure if you're happy face-to-face because -face they're not used to that messaging uh, as they are with the, the emoticon. So, that's interesting. Work down the age? Okay. Right, yeah. Yeah, yeah. no, that's a great question. Unfortunately, we don't have the time to really delve into that. But uh, you know, a lot of it is with, with Xers particularly, they, are, they work well in contractual, contractual bites. Uh, so if you're employing an Xer, and this probably isn't answering your question, but if, if you want to retain an Xer, you sit down and go, okay, we got two years in front of us. Let's come up with a contract. Here's what I expect, here's what you, you know, and let's do this for two years, and then sit down and do another two-year contract. And then all of a sudden, after a series of two-year contracts, you've got the extra for a long term. So I think it's just, you know, understanding that they're transient. Uh, anybody have any strategies for that? It's a great question. Oh, that's okay. I'm not car caring about you guys. Uh, <laughs> No, the question is, how do boomers work down the ladder, right, to, uh, to work down the age range to sell? I think you've got to look for common ground. And one of the things that I'm thinking of is, no matter what age, I think one of our greatest motivators is the fear of loss mm -hmm. is greater than the desire for gain. Right.
my kids are wanting to buy this or they have the house that is in certain sections. And she's like, oh, you're, you know, she thinks of it as like a kid. I had them in that same room. That was it. Even today, I'm getting the cards from them. So it, it's a stretch. And, it, you know, however you're looking at them, whether they went from either an older generation or a younger generation, earn your trust. And then you can figure out the whole thing. Yeah. And, and, and Here's the thing, I'm going to shamelessly plug something, so please, please forgive me. <laughs> but uh, the main job that I do the ma is working with intrinsic motivations. You know, when we're born, we're hardwired a certain way, and that hardwiring never changes over a lifetime. The problem is most people don't know how they're hardwired, and they're living out an expression of something that they're not. There are seven motivations, and all of us have a mix of certain motivations, and that will determine how we want to be sold to. That will determine what kind of salesperson we are. And so there is a tool we have called Who Am I, which tells you what your intrinsic motivations are. Because generations are so varied, but there's individuals within the generations. And whether you're a millennial or whether you're a boomer, whether you're a mature, whether you're an Xer, you have two or three or four strong motivations of these seven. Those, those are consistent. So you would deal with the individuals, and if you know how they're wired, that makes all the difference in the world, as opposed to the generations necessarily. So if you're working with someone who, uh, one of the, one of the uh, uh, motivations is an illuminator. Illuminators, just, they're great visionaries, but they just talk real black and white. Okay, get to the point, this is how it is. You would be an idiot if you're working with an illuminator to not, not just say, you know what, if you don't sign this now, you're dumb. And illuminators go, okay, and they'll sign. But then you got teachers, and teachers need to think about it, and they need to talk about it. But it's very, very helpful to know who it is that you're talking to and how they're wired and motivated. So if you want, if you're interested at all in exploring that further, there's information uh, on the tables and on the chairs there. Uh, any final thoughts? Okay, I think we're out of time. I do have uh, DVDs here and books if anyone's interested in uh, exploring this even further. So thank you.